Thank you, Alexandra. Hello, Munich. Um, thanks for your interest in our panel. Uh, I guess it's an important one since it's about Europe's future. And this future may not be bright, or maybe it can be a little bit brighter when we do the right things. So, um, welcome, Axel. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome, Lee. Thanks for joining. Um, you were already being introduced, so Ax Axel, let's start with you. I mean, you got some um, prominence in the past past year or so um, while you were dealing with, with copyright law, and I guess you are one of the more resilient politicians <laughs> when, when it came to getting this agenda through. And um, you talk, you're still sticking to your topic, actually. So you're, you're still dealing with IT, and um, you have a new manifesto out to, to get Europe out of the woods in, in that regard. But let's start with your description of the status quo. So how would you, in your own words, um, assess how um, Europe is being positioned in this digital markets? Thanks, Carsten, uh, for this introduction also, but um, I'm very much convinced, and Alexandra already told this, that we, if we are not changing ourselves, we are directly to become a co digital colony of the US or of China. And uh, this is why, if, if you're looking to the reality, and this was also mentioned by Alexandra, the f there is no European company in this ranking of the biggest 15 um, largest of market values uh, companies. Um, and if you imagine if Google decides tomorrow to switch off its services for Europe, then what might you see still on the screen? And uh, thirdly, of course, um, we are depending on software industry, on hardware industry, cloud services, and we, we so from foreign countries, foreign regions, and we don't have a browser, we don't have a software industry in Europe, a, a really big one, and uh, we don't have um, other tools and services where we can rely on. So this, all of this um, leads to my conviction that I will, would say, if we are continuing to work like this, then we are a digital colony. And I'm asking ourselves, do we really want to have this situation upcoming? But Axel, with all due respect, what did you guys do in those past 20 or 30 years? So we have done, yeah. No, 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 we, we have done already a lot regarding data protection, regarding consumer protection, regarding improving um, the uh, cyber security. This is an, an, a lot of other things more. But having, uh, if you're concentrating on this, then you might see this is only to protect the status quo. And this can't be a kind of a strategy for the future. And that's why I'm asking every one of us, we have to build now the digital single market strategy 2.0. Okay. Since one, the digital single market 1.0 is not really working, right? We'll get back to that a little bit later, but of course, you, I, I would give you credit for a very honest assessment, I guess. So, the, you're from China, you're from, I guess, China's leading and most respected newsroom, although your company is not really old, right? It's a decade old, I guess, but you, you have quite a voice in, in, in our industry and your markets. People are listening to, to the news you're covering. And with, with your journalistic perspective on, on China and Europe, and the US, do you think um, that Europe still has any chance in catching up in, in digital areas like artificial intelligence or 5G or whatever? I'm here to find out. <laughs> okay, good luck. Um, actually, this is my second time to DOD. The first time last year was a little bit eye-opening um, because here I hear sort of uh, the anxiety you just mentioned that uh, is Europe being losing out? But you don't hear that in China because in China we still see Europe somewhere you have deep tech, you have a lot of talents, you are leading in a lot of areas and specializing in a lot of areas. So we didn't know that Europe will 
challenge your own confidence on whether you are losing out this game or not. And having said that, I understand that, of course, in China, US, and Europe, we're having different approaches. But one year after my last DOD, I think we're probably moving towards the middle ground. Okay, yeah. so there is, there is still respect in China for what we are doing in Europe? Did I understand well, you correctly? The year before and last year was considered as the winter in China's VC and uh, tech sector. And the winter, the only bright spot is the to be sector. That is actually the to business. And the to business part is actually connected very closely to Europe or has a very strong potential uh, to collaborate with Europe. And um, Andrew will talk more about US, but everybody knows now US and China are actually not in the best terms. And that will actually... Not really. <laughs> and that will prompt China to come to Europe more, look for technology, look for collaboration, look for more um, uh, ways to work together to build a system together. Okay, Axel, that's good news. But before we get back to you, Andrew Keen, author, a DLD regular, um, a podcaster, Keen on Democracy is... Um, your news project, I guess. Um, you will present a book right afterwards on, on that. Um, you're an outspoken critic of the market domination of, <laughs> there it is already, um, of the market domination of big tech companies. So um, you, you should like what we are doing here in Europe since we only have small tech companies. Yeah. Well, you, you, more than that, you're doing nothing, which I love. And that Chinese, you know, that was the polite Chinese way, by the way, of saying that they don't think Europe's doing anything either. Right? So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So, I, I like what's... I, I, I did this book, Tomorrow's Versus Yesterday, and I tried to convince Steffi to put that as the title for the DLD this year, and she... She was going to do it, but then she changed it to what are you adding? And like Paul, when I first heard that, I thought that was stupid. But I actually like it now. And it's particularly relevant for this conversation. Because that's the thing. I mean, you know, I respect you, blah, blah, for all wanting Europe. I mean, anything with 2.0, you need to drop that. That's 25 years out of date. Um, but <laughs> the, the, the real challenge for Europe is not you don't want your own search engine or browser, those are again archaic ideas. And I, I think it's wrong to even think of Google as a foreign company. I mean, it's a multinational company. I think the real challenge for Europe is what are you adding? And the challenge for Europe is doing things differently. It's not competing with China or the United States because you'll lose. So there are a couple of areas which I think Europe can not compete, but lead, pioneer. The first is, I think, in digital government. And I think rather than it coming through the EU, you need to be inspired by what the Estonians are doing and their attempt to rewrite a social contract around identity and trying to get rid of anonymity, which is, I think, the most corrosive element of the digital revolution. So Europe needs to lead there. And the other area where I think Europe can lead is in analog. You know, everyone thinks that all the innovation is in digital. The reality is, I think we've known for generations now, is that digital is a commodity. And the real innovation in the 21st century will be in analog. So for example, when it comes to politics, everyone talks about, um, everyone talks about digital democracy. That, I think, is a contradiction in terms. Where you're seeing the real innovation, for example, in democracy is in uh, citizens assemblies where Europe is leading. So I think Europe needs to work from its strengths and when it talks about you know trying to do AI or build a new search engine or browser they're gonna lose. Europe needs to be confident. It shouldn't be catching up. It should be leading and it should be borrowing Steffi's term of what are you adding? What are you doing that's different? from both China and America. And the key area is in democracy because America is a failing society and China is pioneering a particularly chilling, creepy kind of or Orwellian authoritarianism where everything is watched by uh, a neo-totalitarian state. So it's in this area that Europe can, can innovate and really add. Um.
Axel, a few days, a few days before Christmas, you put out a manifesto um, uh, in cooperation with the EVP, um, your, your party in the European Parliament, um, that is basically about all that, right? It's, it's not about a new search engine for Europe. It's about the digital single market 2.0 that will allow a real free flow of data um, and using this data wisely and, and, and get things done governance-wise on, on a bigger scale than we used to, right? Would you like to, to answer, Andrew, on that one? Yes, so um, since you mentioned this manifesto, what I have done, so I am asking for this radical change of thinking, this radical change of mindset, and not coming again with these principles of the 80s. We have to adapt some principles, but probably in a new um, balance. Um, so if I'm looking to these upcoming next developments like a Libra, cryptocurrency, um, even, so it might not be necessary for financial reasons to have our own cryptocurrency, but for competition reasons, we need probably a European cryptocurrency. Otherwise, we will have, again, a situation like the search engine, getting a monopoly dominated by others, and uh, the surveillance everywhere again. And this is what we don't want, and therefore I think we should ask for this. As another example is in China, you have in schools already a school book for artificial intelligence. Can you imagine um, this in Germany or in, in Europe? Um, they are preparing themselves totally different for the whole digital future. And that's why um, I'm, I'm, we have a lot of examples like this. No, we shouldn't do everything what's already in place. We should find our priorities. There are a lot, but then, of course, investing a lot, concentrating on these, and then have a strong political will in coming forward and being the kind of a leading, um, leading continent in some of these issues. Yeah, I want to add to that, actually. The artificial intelligence used in classroom was an example that China is not, doesn't have the consensus using artificial intelligence everywhere. So when schools start to use that, a lot of questions immediately start to appear in media, in social media. Do you have the right to monitor the kids in class, to, to monitor their behavior? Are you infringing the rights? Do their parents give you the consent? So after the media pushed back and all the backlash, eventually they actually removed that from the classroom. And now people start to ask questions that artificial intelligence and facial recognition should only be used in public security related places. So so that's what I'm saying. We are moving towards the middle ground that the Chinese want to have more questions about the privacy infringed and also uh, whether the consent was given on that. Last year, there were um, four ministries in China spent several months, seven months together to uh, investigate on uh, data leaking and also on the unauthorized data collection. And this year, what I heard is uh, we'll have two laws probably passed. One is personal information security, and another is uh, data security law. So these are things China was learning from Europe. Okay, China is starting GDPR is, very is, close. Is European GDPR actually a blueprint for some of those laws? They are definitely starting this very closely. Okay. So that's one Europe is adding is you're setting the very, um, the highest standard data protection law that eventually a market of, when the Chinese market is emerging out of the jungle rules, they will look up to your laws and borrow from that. Okay, I, I have a feeling Andrew has an opinion on that one. <laughs> I know. Are you representing the Chinese government? No. Well, you sound as if you are. In all seriousness, I, you know, I. I'm not going to say I don't like to be rude, because you know I do like to be rude, but um, <laughs> when you sit on this stage and you say that GDPR has inspired China, my response would be, firstly, GDPR is a disaster. It's a, an example of a bureaucratic government at its worst. And secondly, perhaps the reason why China likes GDPR is because it's so ineffective. <laughs> I mean, what, get, get, uh, are you really saying that um, that the Chinese government is impressed with the way in which y Europe is trying to give individuals, their individual citizens, rights of privacy? Because that's the core idea. Maybe it's not successfully implemented, but that's the core idea of GDPR. Um, 
at this stage, I think China has recognized that um, the, uh, digit, the data as assets, that the data as assets need to be under a regulatory oversight. Because for many years before, there wasn't under oversight, and there is a black market for selling that and abusive usage of that. Okay, but, but and then you say the assets, whether that's in the private hands or that's in the government hands. But the, there is a difference between the European government and the Chinese government. European, I don't mean necessarily Europe-wide, but individual European governments are democracies. And the Chinese government isn't. So when you give Ch the Chinese government what you call regulatory rights, you're essentially meaning that it, the citizens are giving up their privacy, their secrecy, their facial recognition, what they do, what they think, what they buy to the state. And in Europe, it's an entirely different thing. I mean, this is a very, very serious issue. It's probably the core political issue of the 21st century. So I think we have to be a little wary of, of, of happy talk about China being inspired by GDPR. Uh -huh. um, let's uh, move back to Europe. Um, I guess, Axel, you are, you're um, not um, really entirely happy with GDPR in Europe either, right? Since there is not one single GDPR and it's uh, probably not something we should copy when it comes to further, further legislation around the digital markets. Yeah, so this is a disadvantage of uh, Europe, Europe if, if we are coming to this legislative process. Even the GDPR has 60 opening clauses to the member states. And that's why I, we, we have to think now differently on all these digital aspects. We don't need a directive any longer. We need a full harmonization in one digital single market in Europe. And uh, so we are already have a disadvantage because we are split, by, composed by 27 um, member states with other traditions, other legal structures, etc. And we are trying to fix these on this European level, but it could be done better. But isn't, is, in all seriousness, can I, I'm not a Brexit person. I, I, w I didn't vote, but I would have voted for the UK to stay within the EU. But on the other hand, what you're saying actually reflects the problem with Europe is that you don't have a political union, you have an economic union with some people wanting to go further politically than others. And the reason why there is no common digital policy in Europe is because you don't have a political union. And all the innovation in Europe is, has, is happening on the edge. Again, I mentioned Estonia. We talk about education, educating in AI. There's lots of excellent AI education, for example, in Finnish schools or in, or, or in Swedish schools. So I think the problem with this conversation and the problem, while, while I think your, your, your manifesto is well-intentioned, the reality is that Europe will only catch up and be able to compete at the individual state level because that's the political reality. And in David's session earlier, the only European companies that were mentioned were the Oxford and Cambridge ones, which are no longer part of Europe. So unless Europe can fix its problem, its identity problem and the reality of the EU never extending beyond an economic union, you're never going to have a digital policy. <laughs> so it, was, I'm, 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 it seems that you're contradicting a little bit yourself. You're saying GDPR is a piece of shit on, on one hand side and the other side is... Um, Why is that a contradiction? Saying, and then you're saying uh, we, we should concentrate on, on human-centric issues or approaches. No, states, not human, can... state, individual states. And I yeah, think another but... reason why GDPR is a failure because it took years to implement because it was another example of inefficient Brussels bureaucracy. And it's only a directive, so, um, but that's technical. Yeah, uh. so the dilemma in, in what the European Union is in, um, this is uh, very diverse. So I, I totally agree, we haven't achieved so far one uh, foreign policy or even one digital policy at the end and that's why we have to come up now with a, di uh, with a different mindset. And, but this is so hard um, in these national thinking uh, politicians and especially the prime ministers and chancellors and so on. If we are not overcoming and, and trying that Europe can act as one, can act united in a European interest, we won't come forward. So um, right now there is a good example where we are acting European because 
German politicians just today in my paper, but that's by chance, said that we have to rely on Huawei when it comes to building our 5G network. Uh, we can't go the American way and have them out. We need to, and we need to be a little bit self-confident here and, and do it with the Chinese. So what would, would you say about that? So I think we have two options. Um, either we can say throw them out because they are spying on us, or um, should we have a kind of a standard, an open standard and controlled standard, and then we can let them in. But this has to be done very seriously. If we are just doing what we are always doing, we are getting what we are always getting. So that's why we need to change also here the situation, either controlling, very deeply and very seriously or get them out. So that's what we will be doing. We'll let them in and control them seriously, right? So this might be one option. Yes. Okay. W will, would this be a good option? That would be a good option. I think Huawei will be very welcome in it and a lot of Chinese tech companies will welcome that as well because like we said, many of them, are, Huawei is kicked out of the US market and most of the tech companies feel they are squeezed in the US market as well. But they, what they want is a standard. If they can pass the standard, which is the highest in Europe, that means they're qualified to compete globally. I mean, Huawei as an example, once they kicked out of Europe, uh, of the U.S. market, and for its uh, handset uh, production, it's pretty much out of the European market as well. And guess what? They dumped on the Chinese market, and who will be squeezed out? Apple, and also the domestic Chinese phone makers as well. So it's a, exactly the extreme example of separating and decoupling also in the tech sector. So I hope the controlling standard will be, um, will be what we see in Europe and I hope Huawei will pass that. Okay, so let's move to the final topic of this talk. Um, I guess um, there is a lot of uh, thinking going on about one, will there be in the future, in uh, just a few days, a European internet with European regulation and European technic solutions, maybe with the Chinese. Will there be a US um, internet and will there be a Chinese internet, which basically already exists, right? Maybe there is a Russian internet already too. So is that the world we are heading into, Andrew? Will we have different internets in the years to come with all the negative effects? Well, I don't think there are negative effects. I think that's a good thing. I mean, I'm not celebrating the Chinese internet with its denial of human rights. There is no reason why you can't have, quote unquote, a European internet that focuses on individual freedom, that respects the rights of individuals to privacy, to secrecy, uh, that, that, that's built on democratic principles. I think the greatest mistake of the, the first wave of digital innovators was the, the utopia of a, of, 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 a, of a world digital community. That was never going to happen, and what's happened over the last 50 years is that politics and the real world has caught up with digital. So John Perry Barlow's famous you know, declaration of, cyber, of independence of cyberspace was always a delusion. And I think we should celebrate that. I think, you know, in my book, I interview the president of um, Estonia who talks about there being three internets, the American Wild West uh, internet, the Chinese strictly controlled internet, and a European one. The promise is not whether it's Huawei or which browser, the promise is again, giving people what they want. What are you adding, Europe? You're adding the principle of freedom to the digital world. And neither the Americans nor the Chinese will do that. So it doesn't matter which suppliers you use, it's the principles overall. Axel, is it an opportunity for, for Europe to build our own um, internet, if you will? So this is so far not really a political option, but um, we also sh should think about, but I think in the first line we need better legislation, we need a more balanced legislation, faster, and um, also be open for innovation, having security also in mind, but also uh, protecting fundamental rights. This 
is what we can do better, and this is what we need to be better, otherwise the competition will um, suffer, and, and that's why I'm, I'm asking forget this better balance situation. Can I just add one thing? I mean, what's, what's clear is we've seen it, demonstrations throughout the world, 2019, for democracy, whether it's North Africa, whether it's Latin America. Europe can provide that internet. It doesn't matter what pieces of technology it's used, it's the, the foundations, the principles defining it. Um, it, it, it. I don't want to provocate an, another argument between you, you two guys, um, <laughs> actually. We'll do that on our own. <laughs> um, uh, but, but still, um, is, is China as, as bad as it seems, or, uh, I mean... <laughs> Where, where's the bright light there, right? It, it, people are, even in China, are still individuals somehow, I guess, uh, even in that community, so... <laughs> you can tell from me, <laughs> I'm a happy individual. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll come back to the China, but uh, just to uh, uh, comment on your question. If the world has two th systems, Europe, US, China, the world is much larger than the three blocks. The other countries, for each one of the block, they may have their right and the, the size of the market to build up their own system, but for, for the rest, they may be forced to build three systems, and that will be a lose-lose for the rest of the world. So maybe for them, the ideal world will be have the European principle and respect of individualism, right. have the US infrastructure and technology innovation, and maybe the Chinese companies' agility to adapt to the local markets. So I hope that will be in the ideal world that will happen. I don't know if that's the digital community that Andrew was mentioning. But the thing in China is, I mean, I'm from the media, and media is one of the most tightly regulated sector in China, but we still do our job. And I think the same with technology is, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of obstacles, but there are also a lot of hopes. What has changed, what has happened in uh, the last 30, 40 years, people uh, always have hope and uh, have resilience and um, optimism that Using the example that I just mentioned, that you think once the, uh, uh, the, the digital facial recognition will be used everywhere, that um, in the classroom, in a lot of pri even private situations, but there are pushbacks. Okay. Yeah. There is uh, the civil society pushback when it's going overboard. Thank you so much for joining into a real conversation. That's what I was hoping for. Um, thanks for achieving that. Thanks for listening in, and our time is, is over. Uh, let's keep our fingers crossed for, for Europe getting, getting into speed. Um, we'll check back next year. Thank you, Axel. Thank you.